Hello, how are you? Okay, now we're going to do a video about the borders of Canaan and the borders of Abraham. And this is a very important video. If you stick around to the end, it gets really interesting. So, let's get started. Okay, the first thing we want to take a look at is the curse of Canaan. It's a pretty famous part of the Bible. And here we are, Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank the wine, and was drunken, and he, un he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brothers. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Right? So Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And because Ham walked in and found Noah drunk and saw his nakedness and then told the others and the others just didn't look and covered him covered his nakedness then they were blessed and Ham wasn't cursed but his son was cursed Canaan his son Canaan Okay, so let's, we're going to look into a little bit of, about the whys and hows of all this stuff. Now, one thing we want to look at here is that Canaan saw the nakedness of his father. And his nakedness was uncovered. We're going to look at what does all that mean. So let's take a quick look here. Genesis 10, chapter 10, verse 6. And the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. So Ham was the son of Noah. Cush talks, it more speaks about the area of Ethiopia. And Mizraim is Egypt. Phut is Libya. And Canaan is Canaan. It's uh, what today we would call Israel. And so Canaan was the fourth son of Ham. So why did Noah curse the fourth born son of Ham? This is a good question. You see, Noah had three sons. And Canaan had four. So Noah cursed his fourth son. Why would he do that? Let's take a look at uh, solving some of these mysteries. We're going to look at Leviticus chapter 18. Okay, starting in verse 6. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. So no near kin for uncovering their nakedness. What does that mean? Is that sexual conduct, right? The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. So if you uncover the nakedness of your mother she is your mother. And if the, you uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, you're uncovering your father's nakedness. 
and the nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, which could be like a stepsister, or the daughter of your mother, whether she be born at home or born outside, even their nakedness you shall not uncover, because it's your step brothers or sisters. The nakedness of your son's daughter, or of your daughter's daughter, even their nakedness you shall not uncover, for theirs is your own nakedness. Okay, so your your grandson or your granddaughter, if you uncover their nakedness, it's your nakedness, your family. The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, your father's wife's daughter, like your half-sister, begotten of your father, she is your sister. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. That's your father's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister. That's your mother's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister. You, she is your mother's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not approach to his wife. She is your aunt. See, so if your aunt, if you have sex with your aunt, you're uncovering your uncle's nakedness. You shall not uncover the na nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You see, so a man's wife is his nakedness. That's the point here, the main point that we get to. Now, before we carry on, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And let's go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 18. Genesis 10. Okay. Verse 19, actually. Now, this is Genesis chapter 10 is called the Table of Nations. And it's Noah and his sons and their sons and some of their grandsons. And so it sort of says how the, the family of Noah began to spread out through the earth and populate different parts of the earth. But the only borders that are really given in the whole table of nations at this whole time is the border of Canaan. Now before I go further, let's talk a little bit about this uncovering the nakedness. So Ham uncovered the nakedness or he saw the nakedness of Noah. So I think it I think that Noah was drunk and Ham saw Noah making out with his wife. That's uncovering his nakedness. He saw his nakedness. And so that's when he went and told his two brothers, he's in there, you know, getting it on with his wife and or with mom really uh, and that's when the two brothers they knew they were drunk and they walked in backwards and covered them up with the sheet that's probably what happened now because Noah I guess, I guess because he ridiculed Noah's testicles or, or his, his sons to come, 
we don't know of any. All we know is Noah had three sons. Um, then he cursed Ham's fourth son. So it's like if you have one more son than I do, then that son gets cursed. So it had something to do with that, with with sexual activity. So I, I from not uncovering his Noah's nakedness, but seeing his nakedness, I guess he saw them mating, and that's that's what he saw. And the brothers walked in and covered them. And they didn't see. They didn't look. They walked in backwards. And they were drunk. I guess they did, had no idea. You know. So now the borders of Canaan. We'll take a look here. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon. As you come to Gerar. Unto Gaza. As thou goest unto Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebuim, even unto Lasha. So why would he, why would the Bible record the borders of Canaan and no other borders on the earth? I think it's because the earth was blessed, but the Canaan was cursed. So God Name the borders of Canaan. This is the cursed part on the whole earth. The Noah cursed him. Now, we're going to move forward here to take a look at these borders of Canaan that are named. Okay, this is a map of Israel. You'll see the Dead Sea down below, the Sea of Galilee up above. The Mediterranean Sea on the left. And right in this little niche here would be Jerusalem. And this is the West Bank. And this is Gaza down here. Okay, so the borders go from Sidon, which is up in Lebanon here. Let's move it up here a bit. Okay, so there's the Sea of Galilee. And up in here. This area here is where Sidon is. It was a Phoenician city. And from Sidon, going to Gerar until Gaza. Well, going on down here until Gaza. And Gerar is kind of this in this area here, in this along this river here. That's where uh, Abraham and Isaac dug wells and they had uh, problems with the uh, Amakalites, I think, with the digging of the wells. So Gerar is probably the region here. On, into Gerar as far as Gaza. Okay. Then from there, going to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah are right down at the bottom end of the Dead Sea. So they probably followed this river here, like that, to go on to there. Like it w it's probably following some natural boundaries along here. And then uh, where, and then on, and then to Adma and Zeboim. Sodom and Gomorrah and Adman, Adma and Zeboim. They are all in this valley here together. So and then, and then it says until Lasha. Well, Lasha, according to Josephus, is right here, which kind of makes sense because you can't just have three borders or three boundaries. Usually you have four boundaries to make a country, kind of. So it goes unto Lasha, right? And then back to Sidon would be, I don't know, something like this. So there's a, something like the borders of Canaan in the days just after Noah, a couple of generations later. So that's the cursed land. The only cursed land on the whole earth after the flood of Noah. Because God blessed the earth 
when after the flood he said no no more will I curse the earth for man's sake so the earth was not cursed Noah cursed this particular part of the earth the land of Canaan so now we've identified that so now God calls Abraham okay let's look at Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of your country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moray, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there he built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. So God's giving Abram the land of Canaan, which is a cursed land. And we'll fast forward a little bit to Genesis chapter fifteen. Verse 18, And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now the river Euphrates is named, so that's easy, where that is. The river of Egypt, is that the Nile River? I don't think it is. Because he names here all the tribes that are in this land. And he doesn't name the Egyptians. The Egyptians are named uh, Mez uh, Mezrium. And they're not in here. It's only Canaanites. So it seems like the Canaanites have spread out from their borders. And God is giving Abram all the land that they have spread out into. So it's from the river of Egypt up to the river Euphrates. Okay, now we all know where the Euphrates River is. It's way up higher. It's up in here in uh, Syria. It goes down into Iraq, you know. So that's the northern border. And the southern border, the river of Egypt, I think it was this river here, this Wadi here. And this, see, in that time, Egypt would be, in Abram's time, Egypt was controlling the Sinai Desert. They had mines in here. They had a lot of activity going on. So they were probably, each, the boundary of Egypt was probably this river. So that would have been called the River of Egypt. Or not that river, maybe a bit, f yeah, that river. Or maybe a bit further down. See, maybe this next, r this river going down this way. Like that. So that would be the Egyptian border. Somewhere around there, the River of Egypt. So that's probably what it was. I can't see it being the Nile River, because then... How far north does the land go on, on this side of the Nile? Does it go all the way up into into Ethiopia and into Kenya? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, it doesn't make much sense. But up into here makes sense. From here all the way to the Euphrates would be that whole strip of the coast, which would be basically Israel and Lebanon, or what, what we'd call it today. So that's pretty interesting how God gave Abram the land of Canaan. And then as we all know, when Israel came out of Egypt through Moses, 
God commanded them to commit genocide against the Canaanites. He listed all the Canaanites, only Canaanites, and they were to be annihilated. But Israel never carried it out. As soon as they got settled in the land, they were happy to just live among them, and they never annihilated them. And so the curse continued, the wickedness continued. And I think that that was the, the whole idea behind the idea of genocide, was to wipe out that wicked curse. But it never got wiped out. So that curse continued to spread out into the whole earth. So I think that's what went on in my mind. Because why would God give Abram that land, you know, and... And why would that land be cursed by Noah? You know, it sort of makes sense that this is how wickedness and, and a cursing came back onto the earth after the flood. Wickedness was probably everywhere, but this was some special kind of sexual perversion going on and, and more wicked than others. Um, they were sacrificing children and... Um, it was, it was w even more wicked than the rest of the people. So there was something going on there with that curse. So now, the surprise at the end. Let's take a look here. Psalm 82. Now in our couple of videos ago, we were looking at Daniel chapter 10, and we were talking about regional angels where certain regions like or certain countries have a certain top angel that watches over that country and kind of that controls heavenly things in that country and maybe certain regions will have certain angels so it's like god's kingdom is like archangels and then lower angels working for god in the earth and God is like the president but these angels are like governors or like mayors of regions and they kind of call the shots and to work for God and to do God's work and they're a part of it so this psalm reveals a lot about this these workings in the the kingdom of heaven in 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 heaven okay so we're gonna we're gonna have to look into the hebrew a little bit because the the translation gets a little messed up here okay god stands in the congregation of the mighty he judges among the gods okay so the the word be used here is elohim now and there's also el Right here is El, and this is Elohim. So this is the singular, and this is a plural. Now, in the, in the Jewish Bible, Elohim is translated as sing singular, with a capital G, God. Because um, if you're talking about the gods of Babylon, or the gods of Canaan, then it's Elohim. But if you're talking about the Jewish God, then Elohim means God, because there's only one God. Okay, so this is why they translate it, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. But in other places, usually El is translated as God. That's, it's the singular of Elohim. So I think the way this should be translated would be this is the psalm of Asaph. It should be Elohim stands in the congregation of El. Okay, God stands in the congregation of gods. 
of, of the God. God stands in the congregation of God among the Elohim, among the gods. See, so here, here Elohim is God, one God, and here he's among Elohim. So the congregation of these angelic beings, these divine beings, is Elohim. And it's the congregation of El. It's the congregation of God. So El is the singular. So gods stand in the congregation of God. In among the gods he judges. Which is basically the same thing, but that's more detailed about what it says. Okay, next verse. He said, now him, this is him, God judging among the gods, which would be like the archangels, okay, and the, these regional ang angels. They're gods to the humans. They're, they've made themselves gods to the humans, okay? So God is s s judging them, and he's saying, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked. Selah is a is like an amen or a musical um, term. We're not sure exactly what it means. It's it, you'll find it in all through the Psalms. Okay, so how long will you accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and the far fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. So these are the things you should be doing. Or you shouldn't be doing this, and you should be doing these things. And then, the, I guess the psalmist is saying here, talking about these, these archangels, these angels, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Everything's out of sync because they're allowing the wickedness to continue, right? And then God says to them, I have said you are gods and all of you are the children of the Most High. Right? I have said, Elohim, you are. And children of the Most High, all of you are. But you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Now this is a prophecy says, thus, it doesn't mean but, it means thus or therefore, therefore, as men, as Adam, Adam can also mean mankind, as mankind, you will die. And as one of the princes, one of the chiefs, you will fall. That's a prophecy. So one of the chiefs of men will fall and the angels will die like men, like he did. And then after that, this is like a statement, after these die like men, arise, O God, because now that... Um, the evil angels have been taken away. Now there's there's good angels doing the job, and God, and everything's fixed in heaven. And this and this is the angels rejoicing. And it says, "Now arise, Elohim, and judge the earth." So now they're going to work in the earth, right? The purified Elohim. Because 
you shall inherit all the nations. So the the uh, and a now this can also have another meaning. Okay, if you think about Jesus Christ dying on the cross now, and we we know from the book of Revelation that that, that him dying on the cross caused the angels to fall from heaven like the stars, and caused the dragon, the devil, to be thrown to the earth. Because how does that work? Is because if he came down from heaven and lived as a man, and he they killed him. See, they were the rulers of the earth. These archangels, they were the the the, the um, wicked powers in heavenly places, right? And they they. Uh, went after Jesus and and brought him to the cross and de destroyed him because they thought that they would win by doing that. But they didn't win because he was resurrected from the dead. That was the victory. You see? So now they're on the earth and they destroyed him. How do they get back to heaven? The only way they can get back to heaven is they have to die and be resurrected. And they need God to do that. They can't resurrect themselves. So now they will die like men. Like, like the prophecy said, you shall die like men. So now they have to die like men because he did. This is how Jesus got the victory over the uh, principalities and powers in the high places. So these are the these regional forces, these angels that are, were not good. And he gained the victory of them. So if we think of that, and then go back and look at this psalm again, look at this psalm again, okay, you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Well, who's the one of the princes? The one prince among men. You shall die like men and fall like Jesus. But they will not be resurrected. And now the victory comes and says to Jesus, he says to Jesus, Arise, O God, and judge the earth. For you shall inherit all nations. He's the king of all nations, right? So here, just go through this again. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. See, so God is victorious through Jesus Christ, and he inherits all nations. They are stuck on the earth to die like men, like one of the princes, like Jesus the prince he's the one prince of of over men so that's all we got for today thank you for listening now i'm only putting out about one video a month right now because i'm uh, putting myself through school and i have a lot of classes going on i'm going to be uh probably doing this much until another seven months and then uh after that, I'll put out more videos probably because I'm running a business and doing school right now. So I'm pretty busy, but I want to try to keep the channel alive and keep it going. So thank you for watching and thank you for subscribing. Um, and thank you for liking the videos. It really helps me out with keeping the channel alive and uh, like to uh, share it with others or keep the keep the message of God going now 
if you've heard all this and you don't understand about how to, what do we do now? Now that Jesus has done all this, what do we do now? You have to believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And then when you believe in Jesus, then you follow what he says. Get baptized. And don't be afraid to tell people that you believe in Jesus. For people who have, who have never who never believed in Jesus before, it's a difficult thing to say you believe in Jesus because you look foolish. But you know what? I'm proud to be a fool for Jesus. So I don't feel foolish at all. It's, it's, it's only foolish in the eyes of people who don't get it. So believe in Jesus, get baptized, read his words, and it's mostly about just being a good person and not hurting other people. That's the main thing. And then there's other details that you can look into and figure out as you go. But from the day you believe in Jesus and you say, you can pray to him all by yourself and say, God, I need to know you. Bring me, bring me to where I should be. And he will do it. But what he's looking for is he's looking for that faith in you. Because he's not interested in people who don't care. He's not interested in people who love evil. He's interested in people who want to leave that and be on his side. That's what he's interested in. So as soon as you give yourself to him and say, I want to be in your kingdom. I want to work for you. I want to be your servant. Then he will act on that. But if you're not his servant, then you're somebody else's. There's no way out of that. Because it's all these angels running stuff. Dark powers in high places. And they're still on the earth. They will die like men. But it'll be at the last day because... God's using them right now to test us. We're like, a, we're, like, we're like a farm, like a garden. And whoever produces fruit will get picked. If you don't produce fruit, well, you just don't have it in you. It's, he's, just, he's looking for that. So do you have it in you or don't you? Like, it's simple as that. Okay, well, thank you for listening. And I'll see you next month.